Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hello, everybody. The topic of today's conversation is about a modified version of insulin-like growth factor 1, or IGF-1. And although we've talked quite a bit about IGF-1, LR3 previously, today let's hone in on another derivative called IGF-1, DES, or DES, however you want to say it, but it's also seen as DES-1-3 to IGF-1. This peptide is structurally truncated when compared to IGF-1 itself, however, just by three amino acids. And the earliest of data surrounding the peptide has been collected from the the bovine colostrum, human brain, and porcine uterus. Interesting and kind of gross. It's naturally occurring and theorized to occur via modification of IGF-1 itself. And a theme we see with these peptides that are similar to IGF-1 is that they are purportedly more potent. And with regards to pharmacodynamics, potency is essentially the measurement of a compound's biological activity in relation to the dose needed to produce this effect. So a highly potent compound is one that, with a smaller dose, produces significant measurable biologic activity. And understanding biologic activity of IGF-1 derivatives is a bit more complicated, however it's not crazy, but we'll get into it shortly. But before we do, if you haven't already, pound that subscribe button, hit the like if you like this video. By the end, if you don't like it, feel free to leave a dislike, uh, insult, or any comment, whatever it is you want. But it's the best way to support a YouTuber trying to make it in this fun, interesting, ambiguous world of peptides. So we've got this 67 amino acid peptide whose only structural difference from IGF-1 itself lies in the omission of amino acids glycine, proline, and glutamic acid. Now what's interesting about this peptide is that it only has a 1% binding affinity to IGF binding proteins which you'll oftentimes see abbreviated as IGF-PPs. And it's been physiologically observed that the concentration of DES-IGF is lower than that of IGF-1 itself. There is limited pharmacokinetic data surrounding DES, but its half-life is theorized to be similar to that of IGF-1, or perhaps even a bit shorter, with limited data highlighting that it's likely rapidly internalized and broken down after binding to the IGF receptor. And I've seen that some of the sites selling this compound comment on its half-life, but amongst all that I've read, I could not find anything indicating a number, so they're either making it up or have access to stuff that I don't know about, in which case we need to have a talk. But let's touch back on the potency component. Basically, with removal of three amino acids, there is an alteration to the structure of igf des which decreases its ability to bind to these IGF-BPs. Now, one of the proposed roles of these binding proteins is to, of course, bind IGF-1, duh, but this would decrease its ability to directly communicate with their IGF receptors. So through this structural change, most predominantly the removal of the glutamate amino acid, igf one des is grossly unable to bind to these binding proteins and thus stays active and can bind to IGF receptors, inducing their activation, hence the increased potency when compared to native IGF-1. There's more active product. If we imagine we're injecting pure IGF-1 and igf des at the same concentrations. And studies done in rodents exhibited pretty diffuse body growth when they were administered des igf one In these studies, it was noticed that muscle weight increased proportionately less than body weight. Early research indicated that although the compound is found in many different cell types, it has a predominantly strong effect on gut tissue. Another study in 1991 in rodents indicated it could preserve renal mass or kidney mass in these rats where kidney was surgically removed, and thus researchers considered it could possibly be implicated in management of renal insufficiency. Although there isn't the most research on this topic, there was one study that stood out to me and especially pertinent given our recent discussions on the risks of growth hormone augmenting peptides. And what researchers did was collect cells from the prostate of some men with BPH, or benign prostatic hyperplasia, an uncomfortable and common condition that comes with aging that's non-cancerous but is oftentimes why males, older males, typically have trouble urinating or wake up in the middle of the night to run to the bathroom, pretty much just difficulties completely emptying the bladder due to enlargement of prostatic tissue. 
And when they administered IGF-1 DES into this collection of cells, it served as a mitogen, encouraging them to replicate while preventing their ability to perform apoptosis or essentially kill themselves off. It's also been shown to increase differentiation of certain colon cancer cell types, and in mice, there also appeared to be a synergy between a certain cellular mutation and DES IGF in creating a pro-cancerous state in formation of accelerated mammary tumorigenesis. Now time for my thoughts, and possibly even time for your disappointment, I'm sorry in advance. But like many of the other peptides out there, there's not much research on DES IGF, and certainly not clinical data. But to be frank, I'm not a huge fan of what I see. A lot of the recent videos have taken a closer look at the risks of these growth hormone augmenting peptides, which has led to interesting conversations with subscribers and viewers, but a lot of the fearful consequences are not due to quote-unquote augmentation of growth hormone, but instead via formation of IGF-1. There appears to exist a pretty strong relationship between IGF-1 and cancerous spread, through not only promotion of growth, but for also its ability to decrease apoptosis or programmed cell death, whose lack is a characteristic of cancerous spread. I know some people will argue the opposite, and you're welcome to craft whatever opinion you'd like, I'm not stopping you, but in my risk-benefit analysis, it's on my no-go list. That said, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this. I hope you didn't fall asleep now that we're reaching the end. But as always, please give a like, subscribe, leave a comment if you can. And most importantly, I hope you enjoy your day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy.